This is the Citizen Link Report. If you find our insights helpful, would you support our video efforts? Your gift of $25 or more goes a long ways. Covers the crew, lights, cameras, all that. Just click on Donate. Thanks from all of us. Communist Russia made atheism the law and blew up the churches. So why is this cathedral now standing a few blocks from the Kremlin? This is the Citizen Link Report. Hi, I'm Stuart Shepard, along with our Executive Director, Tom Minery. Hi, Tom. Hi, Stuart. Today we're going to talk about comebacks, about the resilience of faith, and about the life after communism that's being experienced in parts of Eastern Europe. Let's talk about it. Well, glad to do it. I was in Moscow, a place I'd never been before for a planning meeting for a big conference that's to take place next year. Now that's a World Congress of Families conference. This will be the seventh at different uh, cities, different continents around the world over the last 10, 15 years. It's all about highlighting the value of the nuclear family, mom, dad, and kids. And notably, Russia likes the idea so much they're gonna have it held at the? Kremlin. That's right, and uh, Russia needs to concentrate on people because Russia has been running out of Russians. Uh, the replacement rate is uh, not where it should be, and so the government now has embraced the idea of holding a World Congress of Families conference to talk about not only families, but large families, and to showcase all of this by holding the opening ceremonies and the first speeches in the Kremlin itself. Now, not too many blocks from the Kremlin, you, you got a look at a church building that's, that's an interesting story. I'd like you to share it. Yes, this brand new gleaming church is called Christ the Savior Church. It was dynamited, obviously a different church on the same property, dynamited uh, in 1931 by the communists it became a municipal swimming pool. After the fall of communism in 1989, the people of Russia wanted to rebuild this church. This church is the center of worship for the Russian Orthodox faith. And lo and behold, more than a million people contributed small donations enough to rebuild the church. And As a replica. Well, yes, and it's what's interesting about it, Stuart, is that Anyone who has traveled in Europe has seen many cathedrals, and the, the cathedrals have one thing in common. They're ancient. <laughs> this church gleams. The frescoes are new. The uh, uh, decorations are just a sight to behold. This is not a Western evangelical church decor by any stretch. The theater is a side room that the some of the events for the Congress will be held in is just a gorgeous ornate uh, room decorated in Eastern style. And um, the, the smaller meeting rooms are uh, gorgeous as well. It's, it's, uh, it shows Christianity in a form that we are not used to, but is ancient and still venerated. And this church is a going concern. It's a parish that has about 2,000 worshipers from Sunday to Sunday. And you saw that not only is faith something that they're seeing there, there's also a bit of freedom that's starting to show up, the idea of free enterprise. It is. Uh, just two blocks from the Kremlin walls itself is a subway stop. In the subway stop is a food court. In the food court, you will find Kentucky Fried Chicken, Sabaro Pizza. Now it's spelled with a little Russian <laughs> phonetics, so it, it looks yeah. a little bit strange. Also down the row that I didn't get a picture of is Subway uh, in a place called Texas Chicken. That is the food court in a, uh, a metro stop two blocks from the Kremlin. Now, for us, that's ordinary. You go to any mall in America, you're going to run into these or any, any string of fast food restaurants mm -hmm. on, on the bypass of most communities in America. In Russia, it's an unusual thing compared to where they were just 30 years ago. I think it is. I'm not an expert in Russian or Russian politics, but um, obviously uh, capitalism is finding a place there. All right. Now, you also, after you visited in Moscow, you spent some time in Berlin. Oh, wait, wait I want you to show this picture first. You got to show this. Tom is a runner, okay? But he's the kind of runner who gets up early. And where did you go run, Tom? 
Well, I went running in Red Square, and I got up early because I was totally jet lagged. <laughs> and um, at five o'clock in the morning on Red Square, there's not even a security guard to take my picture, so I had to take my own picture. But uh, yeah, the city seems to be safe, and <laughs> I didn't run into any KGB that I knew of. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was quite an experience being there. Yeah, that yeah. is an iconic photo. If, if I didn't know it was real, I'd think you photoshopped that. Now, uh, from Moscow, Moscow, you, you traveled just a little ways over to Berlin, which is quite a city. For those of you who, who haven't followed history, uh, in World War II, at the end of World War II, there was an agreement between the two sides that Berlin would literally be split right down the middle with the wall, and, and it became an icon of the different approaches to how government could operate. On one side, free enterprise, private property, freedom. On the other side, centralized government and the difference between the two was stark. That's right, that trip was more of a family vacation. Uh, I have a son-in-law stationed in Stuttgart and uh, he and my daughter have three of our grandkids so we visited Stuttgart, took a side trip to Berlin and um, it was a eye-opening experience for that reason to see the differences as Berlin emerges from uh, still the memory, the very fresh memory of the communist rule in East Berlin. First of all, uh, there's a huge building near the center of the city. That is the American embassy. Um, all things American are uh, appreciated in Berlin. At least they were until the week I was there and every headline on the front page of every German newspaper had the words NSA and Angela Merkel in, in it. And obviously it's a big scandal to realize that our NSA has eavesdropped on the cell phone of their leader, Angela Merkel. And that, of course, was a big story. And, you know, it's a little embarrassing, and I suspect uh, governments spy on each other, but my goodness, um, uh, it, it was a little bit of a sour note. Uh, the, 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 the day we were at uh, the Berlin Embassy uh, followed a night of, uh, it was called a light festival in the city, and the American Embassy was dressed up <coughs> with uh, a big uh, glowing illuminated sign that said, Bick in <laughs> ich bin ein Berliner. My apologies go. to every German in the world. Uh, famous words spoken when? Uh, 1963, John F. Kennedy at the, yeah, at the yeah. Brandenburg Gate, is that right? That's right, in downtown Berlin to establish the fact that he, the leader of the free world, declared himself to be a citizen of Berlin to great tumult and a wonderful ovation. And that is a famous line. And so it, it's fun to be in a capital like that where America is appreciated. Now, yeah. while you were there, you also saw a memorial to the Holocaust. This is a city, an area of the world that's still coming to grips with what happened there not that long ago. Well, that's true, uh, Stuart. In fact, right across the street uh, from the American embassy in the middle of downtown is a very haunting memorial to those who died, the Jews, uh, victims of the Holocaust. And I, I guess I was pleased to see that because it's obvious that uh, Germans are embracing the evil of their past, they're owning up to it. But this is a strange memorial. On the surface it looks like crypts, uh, gravestones. Um, and, but as you go into it, suddenly the pavement dips severely and where you entered at uh, with, with these uh, crypt things being at knee level, suddenly you're plunged to 10 or 12 feet uh, below ground and these things rise up and suddenly all that is familiar is gone, all that makes sense is gone, one is, feels lost, one feels hopeless, one does not know where to turn, evoking the memory of so many of those people who uh, were victims of the Holocaust. It's, it seems like a, a touching, haunting Place to, oh, indeed. To visit there. Yeah. Now, now the Berlin, Berlin Wall itself has turned into a bit of an art exhibit, if you will. Well, Tell that's right. It. Yeah, sections of the Berlin Wall still remain, and the Berlin Wall is still a major tourist attraction in that city. Uh, people are still fascinated by the emergence of Berlin from communism uh, to freedom, and they have turned a long section of the Berlin Wall into a art gallery, uh, but it, uh, it attracts a lot of people. And so um, all of these things 
are fresh, Stuart. Many people around the world have struggled with uh, communist or Nazi captivity, struggled free. In, in Moscow, it's the rise of um, Christ the Savior Cathedral uh, within walking distance of the Kremlin, the seat of the former communist power. In, in, uh, in Berlin, it is the Berlin Wall, a symbol of the triumph of democracy over um, communist rule. Now, there's an old saying that those who don't remember history are, are prone to repeat it. And, and it, you may often wonder, why do we express such concern about individual freedom, individual rights, about the, the freedom of religion being protected in this country. I, I don't want to overstate this. I don't want to be very careful about that. But in our nation right now, there are two points of view. One is that the best path is the idea of individual rights, private property, free enterprise, uh, freedom of religion in all its forms. And the other side is we need more of a centralized government. We need government. A government's the solution to practically everything, if not everything in your life, all the way up to and including your very health now is the discussion in front of us. There are lessons for us to learn from this. Well, there are indeed. Uh, overwhelmingly large government cannot lead a society. Whether you do that under the communist realm, whether you do that under the Nazi realm, obviously there's, there's <clears throat> great evil in those two uh, systems. Not to say our government system has equivalent evil, obviously, but <clears throat> The more powerful government gets, the more corruption we will see in it, and it is human nature. It is what we learn from the Bible about the human heart. It is desperately wicked, and when it gets into uh, extreme control of large government operations, uh, bad things happen eventually. All right. Tom, thank you for your insights. I appreciate your stories. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for watching. We always appreciate hearing from you. We read every note that comes in. We don't always get to respond to all of them, but we do see every one. We encourage you to write to mail at citizenlink.com with your questions, comments, etc. We also encourage you to pray for the people of Russia and the people of Germany. As you think in terms of the stories you just heard, pray for them that there would be a resurgence of faith and freedom in those areas of the world. And remember, stand tall and be heard.